I got to tell you, let me just start off, get it off, on right on the table as straight away. I'm an, I'm just a gigantic fan. Oh, geez. I had no idea until Terry was sharing a few days ago, like that he had this project going on. I knew he had his projects going on, but I said, man, that drawing that you have, that you use as your, you know, as part of your email signature, whatever it was, I said, that's just the fucking coolest thing ever, man. Where'd you get that? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't really look hard enough to see your signature in it, which uh, of course I would have recognized. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and we talked a little bit more, and there was this possibility we could have a conversation because I I really get a sense that between the three of us, there's an awful lot of overlap in many issues. And also, I just so I just really wanted to start out by letting you know, uh, just huge fan, huge fan of uh, what Truth Dig used to be, of of course Chris's work, and at least as much as I was looking forward to every episode of his blogging would yeah. be I'd be looking forward to your imagery yeah. and I've been I've been uh, you know on the edges of media for a long time and have a real appreciation for the political cartooning world I don't know if that's the official name but that's what I call it and yeah. I just think you bring um, you know classiness a certain amount of art to it there's there's just this you leave enough question for me to fill in and i so appreciate that and um yeah. so but i i don't want to go on too long but i, I hope you get yay you thank you for your work <laughs> i appreciate it thanks i had no yeah. idea yeah i never know who knows my stuff yeah. <laughs> it's good to meet people who do I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. Join me today in the Poetry of Predicament podcast to speak with a philosopher in residence in the deep uh, adaptation community and Chris Hedge's own personal political cartoonist, one of the most powerful political cartoonists around the world, Mr. Fish. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. I'm Dean Walker, and this is July of 2020. Yet another 12-month-long month in the year of 2020, the year when everyone will know what life was like before 2020 and after 2020. And... Um, I'm, I'm really excited today to be talking with two um, quite different people in my experience, of my brief experience of speaking with them just a little bit before the recorder got going. I uh, got a good buddy, uh, Terry Rankin, from, uh, he and I are connected loosely from the Deep Adaptation Forum community, which for a, a little over a year now has been... Um, offering various kinds of services, both in-house in the Deep Academy community, excuse me, Deep Adaptation community. And uh, that includes the Positive Deep Adaptation Facebook group and the Deep Adaptation Forum, uh, of, in which I'm a, a volunteer moderator. And um, Terry and I have been, we've actually done uh, an earlier interview, Terry and I, and I'll be sure to include that link at the end of this, this particular episode and in the show notes. Um, what, what's fascinating to me is uh, Terry is not only just an incredibly engaging person with regard to this kind of setting up a community of, of support, of, of mutual aid that really is what the deep uh, adaptation community is. And he's incredibly uh, involved in so many ways in that community. 
And on top of that, he's done quite a bit of advanced study in philosophy. And you'll hear that in the earlier uh, episode in which we, the two of us talk exclusively. Um, but you'll get an update today about his studies and how that's showing up, how that's formulating into uh, a more solid expression. And part of that looks like it might end up being a book and a book of essays and so on. Again, we're going to get the details in just a few moments uh, from Terry about that, which leads me to the second person that's uh, involved with Terry's project. And, uh, I was curious, you know, we were talking the other day on, on the, the 400th Zoom call of the day, and, and I said, yeah, so what, tell me about this project. And one way or another, he mentioned who his illustrator would possibly be, and, and uh, he mentioned Mr. Fish. Now, for those of you who don't know Mr. Fish, like, for me, that was a jaw-dropping uh, realization. Like, really? <laughs> I find... Uh, Mr. Fish's uh, uh, drawings to be an extraordinary addition to uh, what's been a long chain of Chris Hedges' articles in uh, the artist that formula, that used to be known as Truth Dig um, has basically imploded on itself and uh, they've exited elsewhere. But uh, for a long time now, I'd look forward to Chris Hedges' Um, writing and equally I'd be uh, just looking forward to seeing how would Fish add to this with his drawings. So uh, we've got Mr. Fish, an extraordinary uh, political cartoonist or artist, and Terry Rankin, um, some degree of philosopher that I don't know the right designation for. And uh, just a, an all-around contribution wherever he is. And um, I'm hoping that we will be able to talk a little bit about each of your uh, expressions in the world. You know, what you're doing, what you're seeing, what you're experiencing in these extraordinary times. I'd love to hear a little bit about the project that you both were, are going to be engaged in or are engaged in. And... Um, you know, I think most of all, uh, I would say that the three of us have a tremendous amount of overlap about being deeply concerned about where we are right now. This is a time like no other in human history. And we have art, and we have philosophy, and I don't know what the hell column I'm going to put myself in, but we've, we've got the three of us overlapping with those concerns, and we have different ways of expressing it, different elements that we each find important. And so, um, you know, if you wouldn't mind, uh, perhaps Terry, I, I guess a good bridge from our first interview to here is if you wouldn't mind just starting out and kind of updating us a little bit, fill in the gaps that I left in this uh, already too long introduction. And um, and just welcome. It's really great to have both of you. A uh, completely unexpected and delightful opportunity to speak with you both in these important times. So, Terry, can you take it for a little while? Sure. Um, <clears throat> let me speak to the academic shadow, uh, because I think of my academia as kind of a shadow that besets me everywhere I go. Um, it was kind of a, a benchmark I had to achieve just to lend credibility uh, as much as I could. And so I did finish a doctorate last March. Uh, it was a doctorate in ministry, which is kind of like the, in terms of PhD in theology versus a doctorate in ministry, it's kind of like the difference between a laboratory biologist and a physician on call the doctor ministry is I want to be a doctor out there ministering to people who need healing. And if there's anything DA does right, they're in a healing ministry. So that kind of took me down the path to DA after a stint with Extinction Rebellion coming right out of that dissertation. <clears throat> the dissertation, and it helps to know this because it ties into what I'm doing with fish, 
the dissertation was titled The End Signs, Are We Getting the Message? And it was entirely about the sixth mass extinction and the climate manifestation and the ecosystem manifestation and the social and the cultural and the political and the historical. I mean, I looked at it in what's, what I think of as a parallax perspective. You look at it from all different angles, right, through all different lenses and try to make sense of what you see at a cosmological level. That's what the dissertation was about. Now, having said that, I would say I don't recommend anybody read it because the only person who would enjoy reading it is somebody who is a left brain masochist because the, the, the academic jargon is obtuse and arcane and it's, you know, it's a classic dissertation written for nobody to read. But along the way, I relied heavily on Chris Hedges for the political commentary and perspective. Also Sheldon Wolin, who, who was, is now departed, but was a political philosopher uh, that Hedges worked very closely with, I actually wrote an introduction to him in his book, Posthumously, Democracy Incorporated, one of my key books on pol politics in all that research. But working in the Chris Hedges, I kept seeing these cartoons coming up with Chris Hedges. And I'm going, Chris, you've got to cut this article in half. <laughs> you know, the cartoon and shut the fuck up, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, they were that good. I mean, a, a thousand words is an understatement for his artwork and my esteem. Yeah. So I started, <laughs> the fish, I confess, I started plagiarizing your art, your illustrations just at, freely. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But, but guilt kind of caught up with me, so I started <laughs> This is in his Patreon account. And I've stepped that up even the more I've gotten to know him and the more I've seen. And one day I just had this wild hair of an idea. It, I, I thought I, I really want to do what I did in my dissertation, but I want to do it for a mass audience, you know, in a way that, that gets in their face and says in very plain language and in vivid imagery, this is what's happening. Wake up, smell the death, because it's at your doorstep. Yeah. That's kind of the message I wanted to get across. And the working title, so Fish, news to you here, I'm kind of backing off of that working title if you, if you are uncomfortable with it. Uh, I don't want to bind you to it in doing a cover. Uh -huh. So... Think about it as you read the stuff. I'm, by the way, I'm the log jam in this collaboration between us because I've got to get stuff written for him to read so he can get yeah. an image to work from. So yeah. that, that folder that I sent you both is kind of where things stand. And like I was telling Dean earlier, Fish, it's a jigsaw puzzle in my mind. Switching from a book of chapters to a collection of essays has helped. Yeah, but I've still got so many cross pollination threads going on between the essays that you almost have to read them all before any of them make sense, and I've got to fix it. So yeah, uh, that's so I'm the log jam. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping we'll get through it because I think we kind of tenuously agreed on November 22nd this year yep. as a publication date, yep. which seems if you know the date, JFK's assassination, yep. that's a perfect date for publication <laughs> all right from our, from our perspective from my perspective anyway so all of that to say that's how i came connected with fish i had this harebrained idea to do my dissertation and i i actually started trying to write it as a book and i kept just it was like you know i'm, I'm gonna get up again this morning and beat my head against that wall and then i realized what was missing was the visual and it instantly clicked yeah so i <laughs> I think I originally, correct me if I'm wrong, Fish, but I think I originally sent the invitation to collaborate to you as a marriage proposal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's, that's jumping right in. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, it made me blush. Well, it's such a harebrained <laughs> idea, and I know he's such a harebrained guy. <laughs> that's really probably the only way I can approach him in some kind of really crazy thing. But I tried to come across as not quite gay, but really love you <laughs> and your work, you know. Okay, great, great. Anyway, that's how we came together, and the working title is, same as the dissertation, the end signs, are we getting the message yet? I added that yet to it. But yeah, we don't have to yeah. live with that, Fish. I, I lift that, that commitment completely and leave it to you. 
in the closing, I would just say that pondering that phrase, the end signs, are we getting the message yet? Keep in mind, it's, a, it's got all kinds of entendres and ambiguities built into it, which is mm -hmm. why I picked it. Just take the major title, the end signs. Is that a phrase that describes signs as a noun? Or is it a complete sentence where it ends is the subject and signs is the verb? You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that ambiguity. I just love it. Yeah. Because as, as you know from our previous talk, Dean, and I know you've seen gotten wind of this too, Fish, I'm all about semiotics. Yeah. Uh -huh. Charles Percy and tradition with and semiotics is a theory of signs. And it provided the parallax within which that dissertation got written, and it still provides the parallax of all of my philosophy. And I'll end with this. I do not think of myself as an academic philosopher. I can carry on doctorate level academic conversations with academic philosophers. But to me, that's philosophy in the same sense that a smoothie is um, pure. It's just, I mean, academic philosophy is just, what can I say, intellectual masturbation. Mm. That's the simplest description of it I can come up with that is apt. And I've spent a lot of time in academic philosophy. I went all the way through a PhD program in artificial intelligence in the philosophy department at UGA. Left when they tried, you know, I thought I'll go back to IBM and start making my money again. <laughs> but anyway, just so you know, I think of myself as a philosopher who lives for philosophy. I don't live to teach it. I don't live to get a stipend or a book published or a grant or any of that stuff. I found a philosophy to live in. Mm -hmm. And that's the extent to which I'm a philosopher. Academic philosophy is the shadow that I drag around behind me, okay? And yeah. unfortunately, it comes across in my writing. So having <laughs> set off that fish, you want me to pass it on to fish, Dean? Or? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Fish, yeah, yeah. thank you for your patience from both of us taking oh, so no, no, long no. here. That's fine. Um, but yeah, it just what Rankin was just saying. I, mean, I, I would just say that uh, what he described his connection to philosophy is, I would, I would argue, is the original intent. You know, I, because I think that that's, that's really key. And I think that, that if people, if more people recognize the fact that there's art and poetry inside philosophical explorations, then they wouldn't be turned off by it so much because it is a way, it is a way to engage with uh, reality and it's a, a way to engage with one's subjective relationship with it. Um, in fact, it, it, one, th one thing that resonated with me when you were talking ranking was the, um, was my connection to art is the same, is the same thing. Um, I never wanted to be a political cartoonist. I never wanted to be even an artist. I just simply was one. And I would say that that's probably how you're connected to philosophy. You know, you come to it with your, your curiosity and your need for the world to uh, expose itself to you. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. So I mean, just thinking back to when I was, the first book that I was most excited to actually ask for on my Christmas list was Philosophical Explanations by Nozick in 1981. Mm. And I remember finding that's when it was published and it had, you know, it, the explorations of epistemology and phenomenology and all of these things that I was just like, well, exactly what is this? And it was this thick. And I'm like, I'm determined to, to A, I had the ulterior motive of, of wanting to be the smartest person in the room, obviously. But, but aside from that, I also wanted to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, we, we, so the, we can jump ahead just a tiny bit to when I went to college for, um, I was a fine arts major at the Mason Gross School of, of Fine Arts at Rutgers. Um, and I got into that program and just, I'm sure as Rankin could attest to, you get into these programs and there's this, this, there's a proper way, a proper way to engage with the subject when it comes to academic, um, 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 you know, mitigating the information inside of these classrooms that, that made very little sense to me. It, it, I, I couldn't move, it, it moved too slowly. It rewarded me for being able to draw really, really well, which I can always just remember 
being able to do that. It wasn't a, a craft that came different. It wasn't a difficult thing for me to do. Um, so it just felt cheap and it felt like it was in my way. So that's why I dropped out and I dropped out and I lived at, uh, at Rutgers in various dorm rooms for the next few years. Uh, so I had easy access to uh, New York uh, and easy access to a really good library at Rutgers. And I went on this pursuit of just trying to self-educate and move at my own pace and discovered, yes, that, that you need to be motivated to figure things out for yourself because you want to find things out for yourself, right? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's, that's really just, I mean, I, 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 I think it'll be more interesting for viewers if we, if we do sort of engage with these ideas and interrupt each other. Yeah. Because I could certainly go on and on about, you know, yeah. I'm not going to be high-hatted by you guys for talking so much. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that, I, I will say this, though. I think that this is one of the things why Terry and I, I think immediately connected because um, I began with that curiosity of trying of, of wanting to figure things out, and I and I also I've read a lot of philosophical books, and I see the the parallel to true scientific uh, study being what what I do with my art, which is it's a kind of play, it's a kind of of you get into a space where there are no boundaries that are making you rigorously follow. Uh, an agenda. You know, the best scientists and the best philosophers are the ones that, it, A, you question the validity of everything. Mm. Um, and you have a, a real disdain for bullshit, for, you know, lack of a better word, because you don't really want to rest on, 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 uh, on, on that. You want to continue to be confused, continue to be um, elated by circumstantial truths that seem true now, but tomorrow morning they may not. And then you start to understand the, 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 how messy the cosmos is and how messy human existence is. Um, and yeah, and before we get into any of that stuff, I'm sure that some version of how, where I was going to take that will will visit upon our conversation. So I'll just stop there. Well, you know, I'd I'd love to just ask you a little bit about your craft, your trade, what you do. I, cause it, it seems like you, uh, there are very few tools, cultural tools, cult, cultural level tools that can be used to counteract gaslighting. Mm -hmm. propaganda bullshit there are very few i've been yeah. looking into this for a while and the the bernays rooted propaganda controlled narrative and so on is seamless it's multi-trillion dollars at this point of development mm -hmm. over decades and it is it has its obvious effects at every level of our predicament and then it looks like duct tape and chewing gum with a couple of paper clips shoved into it for anything that's going to counter that tsunami of influence. And it seems like you're part of that duct tape and chewing gum at the very least. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk shit about you, but I, I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we are undermanned and undergunned, but I think you're doing a damn good job with what we've got. What would you say to that? Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, but one thing, a distinction that we have to make with that, that analogy is that, yes, the, the tsunami is there. Um, and there is a shit ton of misinformation that is certainly distracting what I would say the majority of people. And, and, and we should keep this also to American culture, because I think that there's, there's messiness in other parts of the world that are, that are different, that, that might complicate this conversation a little too much. So if we're just going to, if we're just going to focus on the American culture, um, I would say yes. Uh, but let's make the distinction between how we get information from 
the public sphere versus the private sphere. Because if you look at the, at the history of the United States, there are examples in this culture where uh, the private sector, which is where really the, the arts community resides, it's where the arts community does it most, it, its work most effectively. And again, the philosophical society, um, likewise. Um, and in those spaces, it's very hard, since we're using the word bullshit, I'll just continue. It's very difficult to sustain yourself in the artistic community if you're going to succumb to, to multi-levels of bullshit in various degrees. Mm -hmm. Because people recognize it as being bullshit, right? You go to art for the truth and you go to philosophical explorations for the truth. Where does that reside in the public sphere? correct it is it's diminishing i would say that it's greatly being diminished because if you look and that's what the new book that i just wrote is largely about which is called nobody left it's about this loss of engaging with difficult conversations about what the human experience really is on a personal level um and in disdain of what the public concept is uh it's at one time the arts community had a seat at the table when it, it, when it came to directing the culture in a certain direction. Just to put it in, in a very clear way, um, the art that most inspired me at that time was the satire and the writing and just fiction and, and the new journalism, um, which typically did not attack power as a right-left problem, it attacked it as just a power structure that was that was screwed up, right? If 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 you know anything about the 1960s, and, mm -hmm. and, and that that has always been like true radicalism and true progressivism ignores those different camps of the right or the left, and it also doesn't assume a fix, a political fix is even possible, which I've always adhered to. For me, the political fix to things and getting the right um, a bureaucrat to agree with my assessment of, of, of what's going wrong in the world, you can't do that. It, because ultimately, if you're, because what we're talking about now, we're talking about a hierarchy, right? And so in order to, to appeal to the people at this, this, the top of the hierarchy, in order to fix a problem that is created by the existence of a hierarchy, there's going to be feet dragging and there's going to be, uh, there's, it's not, it's just not going to happen. In fact, I'll do one thing, and then I want to hear what, what, what Terry has to say. There's this thing that I figured out years ago, and in a philosophical sort of just daydream, I was trying to figure out what exactly what we're talking about right now. And what I came to, my conclusion was, that, was there's, people are motivated by whatever value system you have. What is going to inspire you to get involved in a situation, right? Um, so... I looked and I said, okay, if we look at economics, because economics determines so much of how public policy is applied and how willing people are to involve themselves in political discord and political action. The question quite often is how are we going to pay for it? You know, does mm -hmm. it, my involvement in, in radical politics, am I going to be penalized in some way where I'm going to lose money because money equates actually our existence. It actually means whether we can feed ourselves and house ourselves. So there's a direct correlation with literally our ability to survive. So if you look at the economic value system, you recognize it as an accumulative value system, which means it moves up and down. The more you have, the more value is there. The less you have, the less value is there, right? So it's this accumulative value system. If you consider the human experience and, the, and, you, and, you, and you look at human value, that's an intrinsic value system. It sort of moves, it's just like blades of grass, it's just existence, it's, it's matter, right? So it moves this way. So what would the situation that we're in now, if you have an accumulative value system going head to head with an intrinsic value system, there's always going to be a scenario, and we'll get into the human consciousness piece of this because it's very key, where it will, you will be able to justify 
horrible things because it's there's the profit driven side of the economic the cumulative value system so you're going to have a situation where it's always going to be possible to justify screwing over the intrinsic value system because the accumulative value system tr can trump it. Hence, you have the justification for the destruction of the ecosystem and right. the fact that people can look at a, a corporation going into a, a, a ravaged part of the country and say, we're further going to ravage it because it will really incre increase jobs for people who need them. And that kind of logic where people say, yeah, I guess that makes sense. So it's sanctioned. Ignoring the fact that it's, it's connected to a, 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 a process that has exactly what we've been talking about already, ultimately the destruction of the species. Yeah, totally. And I like the, the Trump reference. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you said limit it to America, so I couldn't let that pass. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, Terry, what do you what do you got, Ben? Where 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 is this conversation taking you? I, it's just, I mean, you know, resonant harmony is one of my favorite concepts. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way things connect or disconnect, they're either in resonant harmony or they're in dissonant discord. Right, and that right. goes all the way down to the most entrenched scientific paradigms today, string theory and M theory. They're vibrating string theories and the resonant harmonies make matter. So it goes all the way down to that level and up to that level. But shifting over to what more directly what Fish was talking about, and I know something you're interested in, which is that whole uh, Bernays perspective, Dean, uh, that gap that you were talking about, that vicious cycle that keeps the accumulative system feeding off of the internal. That's what Chomsky identified in Adam Smith's uh, vile maxim and vicious cycle. In his book, I think it's Who Rules the World, or maybe it's another one. But anyway, it's a Chomsky clarification. Right. Uh, oh, it's Requiem for the American Dream, I think, one or the other. But anyway, the, the dynamic of that mechanism isn't socialism. It isn't really capitalism. It's fascism to the core. And I have a blog post about that, and I started to include it, but I didn't. And it's, it's literally making ends meet is the name of the blog post. Because the socialist, capitalist, communist, democ democ you pick your brand of political domination. Mm. If they're dominant, the poison seed at the heart of it is fascism because it totally abrogates every form of social contract. And that's where the intrinsic get hoist on their own petard because we make ourselves targets for that fascism. Right. We live in virtue. We render ourselves with targets on our backs as soon as we live, or live the virtue of our intrinsic value. Right. That's the virtue ethics that goes with that intrinsic value as I see it. And, and you could also see yeah, there's, you just made me think of one thing, because and th and this is one thing that I find very key to people's political understanding as how they fit into a political system. There's this assumption that a government and any and in, in any iteration that you just even talked about, it gives people their rights, it gives people their privileges, right? Where the truth of the matter is is the way the proper way to look at it is you have to ask the question, is it recognizing these rights of personhood and recognizing the humanitarian sort of experience that human being, every human being has a right to, if you want to use that word, which I don't even like using. It's just, it, it's just it, it should be a constant. It should just be a thing. So it's, it's the, it, so once you start, if you can build a society and you, you don't ask these questions, like are you responding to your relationship to the government as something that, that they're giving you rights or are they recognizing your rights? That's not even a question anybody asks. So we're living in a society that is, is bereft and completely, it, it, it's overloaded with these assumptions that everybody um, assumes. And you can, and it makes it very difficult to have the kind of conversation even that we're having now. 
because it's one step back where it's asking you to consider the viability of even ultimately your consciousness, you know? Mm -hmm. And are you reacting? Are you building off of like, are you living a reflexive life? Or are you, are you living a life where you're able to actually consider your relationship with other human beings and how they interact and what, what, what how community is devised and, and controlled? Right. The only way out of the reflexive life of living the permanent lives, and I'll come back to that, the only way out of that reflexive life is to live a reflective life. Right. All the way back to Plato, the unexamined right, right, right. what? It's not yep. worth living. So if you're not being right. reflective, you're going to become reflexive. Right. 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 Uh, and that phrase permanent lies comes from Han Hannah Arendt, uh, activist from geez, early 20th century. Yeah. And famous for it. And she she spoke at length and wrote at length about propaganda and uh, brainwashing and how it's accomplished and then one of the central concepts was that of permanent lies right so where we are today is i've as, as i'm sure you and i will talk about in the book and illustrate where we are today is in a society where there are nothing but permanent lies right and they form this the mythology upon which our civil religion rests mm -hmm. and if you if you talk to the the uh, reflexive beings in our presence, the majority, they're buying those permanent lies as absolute truths. And they're saluting that civil religion all day long with, a, with an M14 in one arm and, and an American flag in the other. Right. You know, and then, I mean, I, I'm, I'm envisioning a picture you would draw. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, but I guess the question, the question that that poses though is, is is this is this a problem of consciousness or is this something that we can will into a different direction that is beneficial now i know that that's that's been a question that people have been asking for a long time but one of the things that and i think it might be now um terry how, how much of the nobody left book have you read because not much i read okay, the one that you shared on share post today that essay that you shared we're not alone okay Okay. I just got it last earlier this week. So yeah, okay. Because I because it's funny because I write when I write these books, it, it's always a first draft. So I I write it and then I just don't even think about it because I'm doing other stuff. So I'm never even exactly sure. So I was going to ask you if this what I'm about to say is in the book or not. So let me just say this is just a connection to exactly what we've been talking about about. Um, who is responsible for how human consciousness works? Is it the individual or is it just, is it our physiology that is, 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 uh, is broken and can't do anything else? So again, this is something when I dropped out of school, I just remember just like following these thoughts down these various holes. And so when I was 19, I feel like I had a, pr a good way to understand human consciousness. And this was it. I had seen, and it might have been in the Philosophical Explanations book, they had the picture, and I know that we've all seen it, the duck rabbit illustration, right? And so the whole idea with that, if you're not familiar with it, it's got, it's, it's, it's simultaneously a duck and a rabbit. And it had many uses in the past, but the one that struck me as the strongest and most interesting one was it was a way to demonstrate or to prove that human consciousness does not perceive reality, it can only interpret it. Because you can only see one thing at a time. It's either a duck, okay, I see the duck, wait a minute, it's a rabbit, you feel your body shift, you know, your mind shift, and then, oh, you can't see them both at the same time. So that brought me to this space, and the analogy that I came up with is this penny and cent analogy. If you have a penny, if I had a penny here, I could hold it and I could, I could show it to you. And I could say it's got physical mass, right? It's its own proof. So it's incontrovertible because it's just like, I have this thing and we all can agree that it's a penny. We'll call it a penny, right? So we're also going to have, we're going, we're going to invest it with a, 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 an imaginary value, an abstraction. It's also a cent. So it's a penny and a cent at the same time. 
So what human beings, what human consciousness has done with that, is it's equated a penny and a cent to be the exact same thing. It's got that shorthand to it. So when I show you a penny, because it's capital that we recognize and it has, it, it, it has application in the society that we live in, you think you're actually seeing your imagination. You're seeing the value when I show you the penny and you think it's real. That is a screw up. So that's it. So in that moment, you have this reflexive comprehension that actually is not real. You're investing it with something. So if you sort of apply that to different things, you can apply that to the obvious thing, the American flag, for instance. You're raised to think that that is all of these things. Hence, you've got the problem with the flag burning amendment and all that sort of, all that debate. Um, but you could also do it with dirty words. You see an obscene word. You've been conditioned to be smacked in the face by the obscenity of that word. When you hear it in a public space, because now we're back to the public and the private way to engage with the world. In private, you can't offend yourself with, an, with a dirty word. You can say it, you can write it, you can do everything. You're not going to be offended. You're offended when you're in the space where that, that uh, obscenity has agency because it's a construction, it's, it's made, it's not intrinsic, it's not real. Right. So that's the question about human consciousness. Are we constantly being interrupted by the version of the scent that is invested in the, the office of the presidency? Clergy, you know, all of these shortcuts that cue us. You know, one that I tell my class to constantly is when I'm standing in front of the class and I'm teaching, everybody has their Apple laptop up. So I see that Apple everywhere. Right. And so I say, you know, this is technology that you are all using for the benefit of yourselves to make yourself scholars to be, and it's sexy. You know, that's part of the, the Apple brand. It's a sexy sort of, it's a brand thing that you recognize as being, uh, you, you know, you're in, you're in the in crowd. What you don't see, what you don't see when you see the reflexive, uh, you know, your reaction to the Apple, you don't see the suicide nets that are surrounding the factories on where these things are constructed. And you're not recognizing how, how, um, how just downright evil the whole process is and that gets you this computer, you know. And also, I'm talking to very, uh, largely, you know, a very elite population at Penn who are there, you know, and because they can they afford it and there's all of these other, you know, these other things that, that enable them to sit there. So long-winded way to just say that what can we trust in how we engage with the world if so much of our interaction with it is you can't think through your emotional reaction of something until you reflect on it. Are we being given the opportunity to reflect on our own behavior and how we interact with other people based on these mythologies that we're just reflexively reacting to? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to jump in there, Dean? Or? I do, yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate this thread. Um, about uh, three, three, four months ago, I got to uh, interview Jonathan Franzen, and uh, he's a fairly well-known author and, and puts out the occasional kind of spicy article, and uh, one that was spicier and uh, kind of aggressively received more than others, uh, he put out uh, September of last year, in which the title was something like, what if we were to stop pretending that we're not collapsing? In other words, can we just stop pretending that everything's okay and, and tell the truth that we are in collapse? And it, uh, in my estimation, it was... Um, just a, a very even keeled, soft, a relatively gentle message of how he is seeing the world that way. And what works for him is to find what he loves and put his attention and his energy into those things. And he, he right. gives a few examples of what he's doing and other people and what they've done in the community. And it, it just seems like kind of a you know, semi-discouraged, but semi-inspired to do what we can kind of a yeah. thing from a frame of we are in collapse. Right. To go right to what you were just talking about, Fish, except perhaps on a bigger scale, what I, I included with that podcast episode was is a couple of other episodes in which I read 
a, a couple of the more spirited uh, responses to Franzen. One of them was from one of the most articulate and gracious uh, science communicators on the planet named Kate Marvel. She's really quite something. And the, the name of her article in response to Franzen's article is Shut Up, Franzen. And the, to make a long story short, where she was going and where many of the other uh, environmental justice people and so on, who had a tremendous amount to say back to him, uh, none of it positive, was that uh, they resented him attacking their hope. That because he's a white privileged male, he had that, all that privilege behind him. And so he could just start to say, it, let's just give up. It's all, we're all in collapse. It's too late. Give up. That's what they heard. And right. they heard it and what they felt to go toward Terry's semiotics and so on is what, what, what was activated in them. And I'm pointing to here because this is where my research and my speaking about this topic goes, is this is where we register the things that we don't even know we're registering it. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, Terry, you say that so beautifully in, in that one article, and I'll be sure to put the, a link if you'll let me, or I don't know what, how we can connect people up with it. In any case, they clearly got activated, and it went right to where hope lives in them, mm -hmm. and where the deep fear that we're all overriding every single moment of every day these days is we're, we're overriding the human-caused collapse of earth and human systems and what that really, really means. Well, that, and that's what I was saying earlier. I mean, because that, that's when I was talking about the arts community. That is the place where you go to be reminded of the, the, how vulnerable human life is right. and how precious it is. And, and that's why I sort of signaled, look at the 1960s, where you have, um, people seem to have this misconception that when you talk about sort of like the emotion, and Justine, as you were doing, and like doing this, there's like this suspicion in the wisdom of what this resonates with your chest, you know, which is a shame because at one time it was, a, it's an, it was a no brainer. You know, my connection, I could connect to real life by listening to John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. It wasn't explained to me. Poetry doesn't, you know, poetry actually collapses when you start to figure out, try to figure out what makes it function. Right. When you try to bring this comprehension to this part of your cognition, it doesn't fit because, you know, language and, and all of that stuff is there's that, that, that getting back to it's an invention, right? The cognitive, your cognitive understanding of the world relies on uh, a lot of concepts and a lot of ideas that are constructed and don't seek proof from your actual experience. Right. right. Try, try to explain your appreciation of a sunset in, in the best you can do is you could talk about, you know, you can look at the science of it and why there may be colors that you're looking at. <laughs> right. And maybe parts of it are just like, wow, the sunset seem to be getting prettier and prettier because of the pollution that's being pumped into the ecosystem. Yeah. You know, um, but just getting back to what you were saying, at one time, the arts community, people knew to go there. They yeah. knew to sort of like go and have this conversation with artists, uh, with writers, with novelists. That's why the new journalism was so prescient and necessary in the 1960s and 70s is because you had people like Truman Capote and you had people like Joe Didion and you had even for, you even had Norman Mailer going into like write about the, you know, the Democratic National Convention from that frame point which is just like, how is this a, how can I communicate this as a human experience rather than a political one? And that's what's really, really necessary because you do have to, you have to engender people with their own understanding on how they fit in the world so they know to panic when their lives are threatened. Because I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a justification that you have to explain to people why we are in collapse and it makes great, great sense on paper. That's, that's, that's the doomsday that we're, that, that we're facing down. There's a, there's a Kurt Vonnegut quote that I really love. 
And it, the quote is, uh, we could have saved ourselves, but we were too damn cheap. Yeah. <laughs> See, because it moves it into that, that area, you know, and it shuts down a lot of conversation. Yeah. And that's what, the, what comes from that is we're allowing the people in power to frame the conversation. And that is going, that's a problem. Uh, Fish, let me just check in because uh, a, a long time back, 10 minutes ago, I don't know, um, you said something around the 60s that there was far less of an orientation toward linear fixes. It wasn't about fixing something within the system that you were admiring something in retrospect, you were admiring that what was often implied was we need to blow this up. We, we need this so needs to change. We literally don't have language for it. And I'm right. making, I'm making this up, but you, I, I hope I'm somewhere yeah, yeah. near what you were just saying yeah, before. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm wondering if you could say something about the calling for that now, because that seems like we have landed between Terry's words in his essay that I'm thinking of, what you've been saying, and certainly where my work is headed right now, is I would call this the, tr the realm of transformation. And I know we're in a world where now you can buy a pair of socks that's supposed to transform your life. I don't mean that. I mean the real deal transformation. This is the lineage I came up in my life, in my own personal practices, and also in my work with people, yeah. is in truly transformation. And transformation is a discontinuous jump yeah. in some life critical factor right that, that no one knows how the fuck did that happen yeah so so we have this transformative moment mm -hmm. and the best we can do when we're when we're not taking the time to drill down into some of the the minutia some of like what yeah. are, what are some of the elements that we can put into place in a, in a in a human environment that makes it a little more likely that a transformation might occur. That's the best. That's the best I could. I've seen ever. No, no, no. I know exactly. It's shamanic, or whether it's psychological or economic, or whatever. <clears throat> the best we can do is kind of set the stage with some of the precursors that make it likely. And I'm wondering whether it's from art or any of the other directions you, uh, all three of us, are talking about. What, what's the calling now? And is it a calling for something tra truly transformative, like like what I think you were talking about before? About yeah, I would definitely say I know exactly what you're saying, and I think that one way to put it is we have to figure out how to. People have have have, have got to learn how to play again. There's a serious job in learning how to play, and what I mean by that is that. I would say engaging with art and learning how to play is when you're most grounded in authentic experience. When you're getting to be yourself and you're getting to sort of have your own curiosities, getting back to Kurt Vonnegut, he, he saw it, the way he put it was just people need to take the time to just make mud pies. You know, <laughs> in a way it's a kind of meditation because you're sort of just like, you're, you're simply being. I mean, it's a very Eastern philosophy yeah. sort of way. It's very Zen sort of concept of just being right now play and that's that's play. by the way that's the that's the center of the kind of body of work that i am am uh involved with when i say yeah. the word transformation mm -hmm. and and it in being involved with training work over the years or with ver various organizations and so on that's where it gets to and sometimes it literally is about playing yeah, and yeah. sometimes and the vast majority of it ends up being in an adult setting. It ends up being about uh, deep being and presence with, with yeah. each other and returning to as deep a connection with deeper self, others, earth, and soul as we can, ma as we can muster. And so just to kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're being invited into the conversation. And that's one of the part, that's one of the things that's key. And not even the conversation, you're just being invited into the mutual experience with another person. And I think that's really, really important because uh, Gary Snyder used to write quite a lot about the, the important job of learning how to play. Yeah. And really at the, the heart of so much of the beat writing is about that. It's about stepping back out of all, the, all of these obligations that society is forcing upon you to listen to your own voice. 
and to play and to take chances and to do all these things. Gary Snyder told this really great story that I've always loved where he was going through an art gallery with a friend and it was a, it was a gallery of, uh, of abstract art. And so he went through this gallery with his friend and his friend was just like, this is terrible. This stuff is shit. He's like, I could do this. You know, the usual sort of nonsense that so many people who don't quite understand how to let themselves go and read abstract art, they're just like a child could do this. Um, and so Gary Snyder was just like, I'm going to give you a, 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 an assignment in this gallery that will help you understand these paintings that we're looking at. I want you to go around the room again and I want you to focus not on the paintings, but focus on the blank wall spaces in between the paintings. And what I want you to do is I want you to pause and I want you to really sort of invest some caring and attention and love of what you're looking at here. Because what you're looking at is not demanding that you get what the artist is trying to say. So do that experiment for me. So this friend apparently went through and just focused in between the paintings. And then he started to recognize how the spaces were actually different. The white walls that were seems to, that seemed to be uniform actually had these tiny details that made them unique and made them special. And in this process of investing it with love and presence with these different things, he started to recognize vulnerability, started to, it started to sort of have this cascading effect where it echoed back on him that apparently when he was done, he was in tears from the experience. Mm -hmm. And so that whole idea mm -hmm. of doing what animals know to do naturally with their physical play, which is figuring out how their, their physical bodies can interact with, other, with the world in a way that is safe, but also has built into it, how can I turn this and weaponize this in order, in, in order to feed myself and do these other things. Human beings need to have similar play to figure out what their personal, what boundaries are natural to the human experience as opposed to the ones that are imposed by, uh, you, know, you know, the structure of society. So mm -hmm. to, to, to the, your question of what we need to do, again, what we need to do is we need to get people used to playing again, understanding their vulnerability and how they're connected to an authentic experience. So they recognize when that experience is starting to be taken away from them by society and power structures and what is asked you know of them from the dominant culture they know to panic they know to throw their elbow up and just be like whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute you're actually asking me to pacify myself and become something less than i should be and i think again the arts community has got this history of always reminding people and if we can look at different societies where it's been successful if you look at the paris commune after um, napoleon was defeated they asked many artists and poet, uh, poets to be part of this new experience of what can government be? If we need to have some sort of structure because the population is so large, we, I guess we need some rules that we want to say out loud and expectations that we want to say out loud. Let's bring in artists to be part of that. That whole idea lasted for, I think it was four months before it was crushed because usually people with the guns are the ones who come in and then determine you know, how the debate is going to end, sadly. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much. Terry, what's happening over there? Well, I've got to say, this is, you've overwhelmed me with your dialogue here. It's been, you've left me playing whack-a-mole with the buttons you've pushed. <laughs> 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 I mean, literally, ideas are just popcorning in my mind that connect to all the things you were saying. I hardly know where to start. We should do a book together. <laughs> I'm hey, what a great idea. <laughs> but Fish, let me start with, uh, you began by talking about kind of a dichotomy or a disconnect between uh, consciousness and the world, I think. Mm -hmm. And you hit a nail, a very important nail squarely on the head there from a semiotic perspective. And to go to what you were both just talking about in terms of pacifying ourselves, 
What I'm saying in, in, in the dissertation and what I want us to get across in the book we're working on together is let the end sign. I don't know how to put that message more simply. Right. Yeah. Because if you just take yourself out of observing truth and reality and the reality of the cosmos beyond and just encounter it and let it send its signs through you, you aren't even conscious of it yet. You're just encountering it. That's right. full, full awareness of your presence has nothing to do with the model you build around that up here, okay? Mm -hmm. The biggest mistake we can make is a category mistake where you, you think something is one thing, but it's something else, entirely different, completely different category. Scientifically, right. it's a, in a completely different reference class. It's not apples and oranges, it's rocks and air. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so the category mistake that you put your finger on there is taking the, the model to be the reality. This truth in my model that is utterly contrived is the reality of the experience I observe. Mm -hmm. And that is a grotesque, egregious, fatal category mistake. And it's exactly the category mistake that 21st century science makes as business as usual. Mm -hmm. I mean, they literally are talking about, of all the absurdities I've heard lately, we're on the verge of knowing the mind of God. Stephen Hawking. I, I'm quoting Stephen Hawking. Right. The last line in one of his books, I, mean, I forget which one, but I'm, I read that line, I, I read his stuff a bit, and I'm going, what lunacy is passing for science? And then, then, uh, even this was before I even got involved in DA and Extinction Rebellion and all of this. And I want to come back to Joanna Macy, Dean. Don't let me forget that. It, it was um, even before I got involved in Extinction Rebellion and all this, I knew that this was where we had disconnected, that that category mistake had, had, had broken us away from real truth and reality to the conventional, arbitrary, utterly symbolic, conscious truth and reality that we devise for ourselves out of purely symbolic convention or out of the permanent lies that are fed to us as the signs we take in through the presence of our awareness. Mm -hmm. and we, they get here now before we even know it's happened. Yep. That's what I mean by the semiotic engineering that I refer to. Yeah. The semiosis, the processing of signs, begins beyond us. We filter it through our five senses. There's no red in the universe. There's no scent in a penny. Right. It, they're just not there. Right. And the, the duck rabbit image, originally that appeared first in Wittgenstein. He dug it up out of some old German thing he was reading and put it in yep. one of his. I mean, yep. it's, this stuff has roots that go so far back, and yet human history has been a bloody death march to destroy art, truth, and reality. Right. And if anyone thinks we're living in a rational, scientific world, what rational science would take us to where we are now? <laughs> Find me a scientist that will even acknowledge that question, yeah. and I will salute them as a good philosopher. <laughs> but if they won't even, I tried in Extinction Rebellion with XR, scientists for XR, I said, would someone in the scientific community at XR tell me how rational science got us to where we are and right. still say it's rational science? Haven't got a response yet. Yeah. Well, we need somebody to acknowledge the fact that just when farming was developed, what is 13,000 years ago, that that one should be able needs to look at that and see that not as an advancement of the hu of, of 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 the human animal, but the beginning of a huge problem, because being able to control the environment in that way, and to to isolate yourself from an ecosystem that actually created you, or you were yeah. formed from processes from that ecosystem, is is to your point. 
is, is, is a huge, huge recognition that animals that remove themselves from an ecosystem and can justify that removal are flawed. And how do we deal with that? How do we deal with our advancement as a flaw rather than as an advancement? That's to the point. I was telling yeah. Dean just before you joined, this is what my notion of permaculture sovereignty is all about in the mm -hmm. light. Before, before, you go, before you go to permaculture sovereignty, you asked that I remind you about Joanna Macy, and it seemed like this connection, disconnection moment might be a good place to remind you. Thank you. Thank you. It is. Um, I can get back on the other one if we have time. Um, what I like, I, I know authority on Joanna or work that restores, but just on, on its face, I take it to be a, a value worth living into because of its resonance with this permaculture sovereignty, among other things. But to your point, Fish, and yours as well, Dean, about play, right? We need to relearn what it's like to play and learn to live in that play space. Um, and put that together with the notion of work that restores, uh, and you've got doing what you love as the way to play and the way to restore, beginning with yourself. So that's why I'm doing this, because it's work that I love with people that I love, and it restores and rejuvenates and renews me to do that. Yep. And when I'm not playing at my work like this, <laughs> I'm playing at my work in my family. Mm -hmm. Because that's where the shit hits me in the face. Every yeah. time I look in the eyes of my grandchildren, it just smack. And talk about getting hit here. Yeah, exactly. It's an iron fist. Every yeah. time. Now, one last thing, a temporal comment, a time comment. I don't know if I wrote about this in the papers you saw, but uh, two things I've been dealing with lately. And by the way, my lead mentor, Lynn Sweet, in my doctor of ministry program, he tells the creation story as a mud pie making exercise. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't help but connect those dots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, I lost where I was going. I knew that mole would jump. <laughs> <laughs> um, Join the Macy, work to restore. Oh, uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Yeah. Have you noticed what they've done with the Doomsday Clock? First time ever in its 74 year history, it's gone under two minutes. Yep. Now think about, and, and think about fourth quarter football, American football, Goal line stand, a minute and 40 seconds left. But don't even ask the question about the score. Right. Because it ain't tied. Yeah. It ain't tied. We've already lost the game. Right. We're playing against Mother Nature. And that's what began, Fish, in that pre-industrial agricultural hubris right. of rebelling against cultural sovereignty. You see what I mean? Yeah, you should have totally. learned what grew freely in the wild, period. Yep. And eat roadkill when yep. a tree falls on a deer. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? That would have been well, a more rational approach. So anyway, all of that to say with my family and with beloved connections like you guys and others, that's where the play comes alive. That's where the restoration begins for us as, as individuals and I don't know what to say, but Lord willing, spreads beyond us to others. Well, part of that, too, is it, it, if we have to smack them in the face with it, fish, so yeah. be it. Well, that's, and, and to your point, I like the analogy of a football game, because um, when it comes to the work that I do and the language that I use to communicate my ideas, it's a visual language, you know, which predates the written, where the invention of the written word by tens of thousands of years. Maybe. So there's a certain agency with that, and there's a certain there, there, there's a certain truth that is embedded in that kind of communication. Um, but I would also extend it to uh, listening and just and, and like the physicality of life, like learning from the physicality of life. Just to, to to piggyback onto the football game, where we're doomed is people are reading about the football game. <laughs> 
they're not watching the football game. And that's one of the things with sports. Anybody who has any connection to any sport, why is it so meaningful to actually watch the game? Why not just wait till the next morning and read about who won? It's because our connection to that experience is a physical, we're physical people who engage with physical life. Mm -hmm. That's the meaning of the experience. It's not about finding out about it later as this abstraction because you're not engaged with it. Let's learn to live in the, in the world in such a way that we have all this sort of the, the yippee experiences and also the terrified experiences and know what to do with our physical bodies and the physical bodies of, of the people that we love and we care about. How can we protect our physical bodies in connection to how we protect our ideas that should be much more benign and, 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 and connected to the, the extension of the species rather than the justification for the end of it. Yeah. I, I don't know if you guys both read the waveform semiosis yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was, one, it was well, one of my favorites. Did you did you catch the little play the hundred second game that I put in there? I think it was in there. Yes. I, somewhere in one of my, one of the ones that works in progress, I put in the one hundred second game. Yeah. Based on the doomsday clock. Right, right, Which right. One hundred seconds to read this next little snippet that I put here. It's about a yeah. tweet size thing, and if you finish before one hundred seconds is up, you don't move on. Hey, you're right. You went that, there for yeah, yeah, yeah. Time, right? Yeah, then you yeah. Move on, but you don't move on until you forget everything you read in the last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of the same effect, I hope, as going yeah. to the gallery and looking at the walls. But yeah, yeah. Can reach you. I want it, that hundred second reality of every hundred seconds now, we beat the odds of surviving. Yeah, yeah. And it's a perfect it's, way to attach. Yeah, like, and, and I love that because it reminds me of something that I had in the first book that I wrote. It didn't make it in, but I thought it was a really interesting experiment. I forget exactly what the words were, but I wrote on the page basically a sentence that said, um, what, the experiment was, watch how easily I can make you do a physical act without you even thinking about it. And the reason is, is because I wrote it and I wrote it in sort of a circle, making the person when you were reading it, you had to turn the book. <laughs> I'm like, so just now imagine that piece of paper is connected to a, to a turbine that is doing all of these horrible things. And you have no connection, no understanding of what you're contributing to. But I'm giving you this language that is making you sleepwalk into something that has a physical, it is turning a turbine that is actually threatening, you know, world survival. Imagine that That's because beautiful. you're surrounded by those mechanisms. That's beautiful. Yeah. One other thing, and I'll, I'll stop here. As you both know, I am a Christian, but I have nothing to do with mainstream Christianity. I'm, I'm more like Hedges as a dissident or a right, Christian. Right. So let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I come from the Cumberland region of the Appalachian Mountains, west into the foothills of the Bluegrass region. In the Great Awakening back in the 19th century, early 19th century, a shaking Quaker movement called the Shakers mm -hmm. had moved into the United States in 1794, and they had established communities in central Kentucky, about 80 miles from where I grew up into my adulthood. And I was always kind of fascinated by them because they're a strange cult. First, they're led by a woman. It was founded by a woman whose name was Ann Lee. And they were a very ascetic cult. They didn't, or sect, they didn't marry. They lived a life of celibacy to the best of their ability. There was a lot of backsliding, but they, their one prime directive in their followership of Christ was to not procreate. They, they wanted, by any and all means necessary, short of physical mutilation, to simply, by force of will, not bring children into this world. Now, here we are, right? Hundreds of years later, and we look back and we go, you know, that would have been a pretty smart way to live. Think of where we'd be now if that had become a predominant American religion. And because it was, 
you know, in my dark and bloody ground of my home state, Kentucky, I started looking into it again now that I'm on the other end of my theological quest. I'm going, you know, and talk about art, Fish. Do you know what shaker crafts are like? Mm -hmm. If you want an original shaker chair, yeah, they are so simple and perfectly elegant. And up in Pennsylvania, you're in the earliest area of the yeah, shaking yeah. corner. Yep. The aesthetics of their work is just astonishing. Right. And the science that they worked out to build their their worship rooms where they would go and dance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they literally danced and shouted and, you know, the, what we would dismiss as being taken up in the spirit these days, but they were just trying to beat that sexual urge down <laughs> <laughs> for the most part. And it worked, yeah. but they built rooms that were 60 feet on a side with no posts in the middle of the room. So they wouldn't bump into it. Uh -huh. They hung all those perfectly crafted chairs up on the wall so they could dance. And I would die, so I went to the community that they restored in Kentucky, about in, uh, near Harrodsburg, and you could go upstairs and see how they did it. And it was all flying buttresses, all the way across in a dome over that room. No wires holding that thing up, all flying buttresses. Yep. And then it went out to the walls. I mean, it was, it was a thing of engineering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, all of that to say, I'm really intrigued by the Shaker sect these days. Yeah. And they were pacifists to the core. Yeah. I mean, they were Quakers. So they yeah. were pacifists to the core. So imagine, and talk about permaculture sovereignty, they were agrarian, but they did it in, in utter fealty to what I call permaculture sovereignty. And their slogan was, hands to work, hearts to God in everything they did right and and you know i'm not promoting or proselytizing or trying to you know this is not me being a christian evangelist okay i don't yeah, do that yeah. i'm talking to you about a philosophy of a religious perspective right that i find utterly enchanting at this point in life simply because if i flash back and say what if we'd gone down that road what if we had gone you'll love this fish in project management, there's a thing called fishbone diagram. Uh -huh. Think of a, of a fish skeleton. They're causal diagrams. If the head of the fish is the problem, the tail is before the problem existed, and the bones are all the causes that contributed to the problem. And it's called a fishbone uh -huh. diagram. Uh -huh. and to me, where we are today is the result of every tipping point road not taken throughout human history. Mm -hmm. And those shakers to me represent one of those tipping points. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <For a while. laughs> I missed a lot of moles, but be that as it may, I'll put my hand <laughs> down. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I, uh, I need to acknowledge that the, the envelope of our time together has started to close and I uh, I just couldn't be more excited and feeling resonant and appreciative of the passion that that we all three bring to this conversation. And it's rare that I get to go to these places in these conversations. And and I, so I just deeply appreciate it. And I really hope against hope that this is not our last time. Uh, in any combination of us to be back together and, and exploring this realm. Uh, it feels important. It feels like in our own relatively small ways, we're each bringing the best that we can to a tsunami, a very, very dark tsunami. And uh, I can't think of a better way to be facing it than with beauty and with our art. Each, each of us bringing whatever our version of art is. Uh, I'm very moved. Um, again, just so appreciative. Um, that's what I would say. I guess the last thing logistically is, is uh, for the folks who are watching, I will be uh, collecting 
all the various links that uh, each of us has mentioned today so that you can contact more of Fish's work or Terry's blog and, and uh, Deep Adaptation and so on. Uh, is there anything that either of you would like to say uh, as, you know, because there are a lot of folks that watch this that don't really have as much traction, as much time on the path as all three of us have. So we've been able to speak kind of offhandedly and multidimensionally and really, uh, even though it's at its core, it's the darkest and most challenging conversation in human history, there's also been humor and there's also been love and there's been the sharing of little, little shards of our creativity that we've offered up for each other to look at. And Fish, I'm hoping that you're gonna uh, offer us a few images that we can put up during oh, pieces sure. of this interview. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if there's anything that either of you would like to just briefly say to finish up speaking to someone who is kind of new to this conversation and it can look, it can look overwhelming. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have anything from your heart to theirs to, um, not necessarily about hope, but really about uh, what can feed their heart or what has fed yours along the way. Um, I think it's, a, it, it's, it's about camaraderie. So I think that the, the starting part is uh, people not feeling so alone. Um, people knowing that you do not need you don't even need an agenda. <laughs> uh, if you can just create and recognize even moments of pain, moments of just experience, authentic experience, uh, understand that, speaking personally for myself, I understand that when I make my work that I feel that I'm congregating with other people around my own pain and also their pain. I'm trying to recognize the fact that we are suffering. Um, and one of the many tactics that one can use when one is suffering is to rejoice in the feeling that, or the reality that you're not alone um, and look to communicate with your, the cells that are the, in the deepest, darkest place in your body that there is music. Uh, and there is an innate comprehension and understanding and knowledge on knowing how to dance to that music because it's there. So I think that, yes, we do use humor and there's it's certainly a lot of my humor is gallows humor um, because we are, I am acknowledging that we are in pain, but we have to, we have to maintain our energy and our mission by, um, by, clapping each other on the back whenever we can. And when you're with a chum, you do that by telling them a joke. You, to, you, you do that by telling them an inappropriate thing, but you also tell them to recognize um, if this isn't nice, what is, which is what Kurt Vonnegut used to say all the time. Once again, a, a nod to <laughs> Vonnegut. Beautiful, thank you. Terry, do you have anything? I'm muted out there because I was punching my keyboard. I wanted to make sure I got the right author here. I, Yates and Dylan Thomas, W.B. Yates and Dylan Thomas are two poets, along with Les Murray, that I've been, I keep, I mean, the first two are really well known, of course, and in Australia, Les Murray is really well known, but I, the Rage Against the Dying of the Light is a line that comes from a Dylan Thomas poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, you know, um, that line is profound, to be obvious. And everywhere I look, what I see as the common experience, whether we acknowledge it or not, for every human on this planet now is a rage of grief. We don't know, maybe, that we're raging, we don't know that we're grieving. We may have so numbed ourselves through self-medication of any number of a billion forms or through permanent lies that we savor as if they were, I think of the matrix. I know it's not real, 
but it tastes so good. Said <laughs> what's his name? Bite, you know, what was his name? Cypher. Right. I know this steak isn't real, but it tastes so good. You can ignore it, deny it, refute it, argue it, resist it, die in it, but it is a rage of grief. And the grief is the loss of the light of love in our lives. And we're raging against it because the three of us and a few others know in the marrow of our bones that's what's happening. And it will surface as rage. I mean, my, my daughter made me wear this. She accused me of having anger beneath fear. And I said, that's not what this feels like. And she kept insisting, now, Dad, come on, you know that when you, you act out in your anger, and I am, I can be a pretty angry guy, put a guy on the wheel of a car and just watch. <laughs> but she challenged me. She, could, she I would get angry with her, and she would say, Dad, I know your anger is really rooted in a fear, and you need to deal with that. So I took her at heart, and I dealt with it. And no, I have fits of temper because I'm in a rage of grief. And those are two very different things. When I come, when I fish, if I were to send you an email that said, you're an idiot and you're full of bullshit and your art stinks like camel dung, you know, if I sent you something like that, it would be a fit of temper, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I could do a lot worse. But anyway, I have fits of temper. They're, they're uncontrollable. They're, they're regurgitations of that rage that's resting in that swamp of grief. And it's the dying of the light of love that's at the root of it all. Yep. So my advice to every human that sees this or encounters life is rekindle that light from within. And then let it shine. That's almost biblical. <laughs> <laughs> I was reaching for my tambourine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, Dean, that's kind of how I, that's kind of my closing line. Yeah. Face your age of grief, rekindle love in your life, and let it shine. Beautiful. Um, I just want to take one last moment to thank you both so much for taking your time. I know we're all busy these days, and we're all spending too much time on these computers and Zoom calls. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's meant a tremendous amount to me, and I, I hope that the folks who are going to end up watching this will also find it as as beautiful and as valuable as I have. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for bringing it together, Dave. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is exactly the kind of time I seek to spend. <laughs> thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. Produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.